Lesson 16. We have read Redemptor Hominus. Let's see it as a blueprint for his pontificate. We began our course on Redemptor Hominus with a brief discussion of John Paul the Great, and we talked about his accomplishments, <clears throat> but saw they were great because of his prayer. I also said that Redemptor Hominus is a turning point in understanding John Paul II because he brings into it all that he had as the Pope from a distant country, his Polish background, his life of prayer, his poetry and drama, his philosophy, his priesthood, the dramatic history really of Poland. We see, and I think I've pointed some of these out in Redemptor Hominus, but it also allows us to look forward. Now that he has gone before us, he died in 2005 and is now proclaimed a saint, so he's in heaven, where he will intercede for us. I would like to look how this encyclical does contain the seed of so much of his pontificate. Okay, well, let's discuss some of the great accomplishments, and then we'll talk about his encyclicals. The great um, biographer George Weigel, who spent time with John Paul II, was interviewed at one point by a Catholic news service and said, I hope history will remember John Paul II as the great Christian witness of our time. Everything else he did to change the world and revitalize the church flows from that fact. He truly believes that Jesus Christ is the answer to the question that is every human life. That's the conviction that animates his ministry as Bishop of Rome. He said this, by the way, while the Pope was still alive. That's the conviction that undergirded the most dramatic moments of his pontificate, the call to be not afraid, the ep epic pilgrimage to Poland, the two addresses to the UN, his showdowns with the Sandinistas in Nicaragua, rioters in Chile, his pilgrimage to the Holy Land, the Great Jubilee. That's also the conviction that runs like a bright thread through his teaching. The great question for the Catholic Church at the end of the second millennium of its history was this. I'm still quoting Weigel. Could the church give a coherent, compelling, comprehensive account of its faith and hope? John Paul II answered that question in the affirmative. Through the catechism of the Catholic Church, through his own magisterium, and through his remarkable capacity to make Catholic convictions come alive in history in the collapse of the European communism and so on, we see it all fits together, the renewal of the church and the impact on the world. It would be hard to identify three greatest accomplishments within that framework, but the three accomplishments would be the catechism, the 79 pilgrimage to Poland, and the great jubilee of 2000. That's George Weigel's first summary of the pontificate of John Paul II. Well, I guess I would say after we've been through Redemptor Hominus, that this one encyclical in a way, you can see what he has accomplished. That is making Christianity making the mystery of redemption coherent and compelling to believers and to non-believers, to the world at large in this new age and into the new millennium. Now, Mr. Weigel in his biographies will list 
as many will do, the various key deeds and accomplishments of John Paul II. I know in his the second biography, The End and the Beginning, he picks 10 and elaborates on those. Um, I propose to consider five key things, and I'll mention some of how they fit in with Mr. Weigel's. The first one is he stabilized the church after Vatican II. He saw the proper thrust of Vatican II. As I had earlier said, Pope Benedict said that John Paul is really the authentic interpreter of Vatican II because he was there. And as the Pope after Vatican II who inherited the name John Paul, those who presided over the council, he's the one who helped the church to find its way after all the confusions of Vatican II. Andre Frassard reminded us how challenging it was to take the chair of Peter after the crisis of Vatican II. He wrote the following, to the disinterested observer, the church was showing clear signs of internal disintegration. There were at least two churches in Holland, one of them playing at throwing its hat over the blades of the windmill and then attempting to catch it. And the other one, the conservative one, was called anachronistic and reactionary, was on the defensive. That's the divisiveness of the church after Vatican II. Frassard continues, in Germany, there was a theologian who persisted in calling himself a Catholic while inveighing against Rome in the manner of a Luther, but with less eloquence and more pedantry. In Spain, always very Catholic, the higher clergy let themselves float on the prevailing winds. In France, we saw the first punches in the boxing match between an ultra-conservative bishop obsessed with old liturgical formulas that he came close to branding the Second Vatican Council a work of the devil. And there was an opposing contingent ready to throw the liturgical and pastoral baby out with the bathwater, clergy who preached democracy and pluralism. This group was led around by their nose and took the slightest objection as an insult and the meekest question as evidence of intolerable defiance. Frassard looks to the United States and said some of its clergy thought the best way to combat error was to appear to partake of it yourself and meddle in contemporary society, to make pastoral letters on issues on homosexuality or marriage, in Latin America, the popular churches drew themselves up in full battle array against the institutional church. These are the things that John Paul II inherited as he came up to take the chair of Peter. And so Frassard will say that one has to consider in this book he wrote, by the way, Be Not Afraid, which is the opening announcement of John Paul II to explain his pontificate. He will, he will step up and say that Christians who perhaps have no longer know how they ought or ought not to believe and have suffered in this, what Frassard calls a silent stampede as the faithful desert the churches. He said, here comes Carol Wotiwa. He stood in the doors of the basilica, and as soon as he did, Frassard and his friend said, and thousands more besides, had a comforting feeling of awakening from a bad dream, and the deeper, stranger, rarer impression of having been touched by grace. End of quote from Frassard. John Paul II said Vatican II was a gift of the Spirit to the Church, a fundamental event for understanding the Church's history at the end of the century, but first and foremost for exploring the abiding presence of the risen Christ beside his bride in the course of world events. 
He said that in 2000, but that looks back to Redemptor Hominus. Or he would also say, the Vatican Council contains what the Spirit says to the churches. Well, the Spirit is the answer to the materialism of our age. George Weigel also includes this idea that securing the legacy of Vatican II is one of his great achievements. The publication of the Catechism of the Catholic Church is part of that achievement because it makes the doctrinal dimension clear. All of this can be discerned in Redemptor Hominus. Vatican II is the context for it. He uses Vatican II to build his case for Christian humanism as well as for the mission of the church in the world. Clearly, Redemptor Hominus is a fruit of John Paul II's participation in and deep understanding of Vatican II. I will now go to the second achievement, I would say, is the initiation of the new evangelization and being the Pope of the new millennium. Again, Redemptor Hominus is an exquisite expression of what is demanded by the new evangelization. As he would later write that Pope Paul VI, who stimulated the collaboration of the lay faithful in the spreading of the gospel. He recalled that the evangelizing activity of the laity in the vast complicated world of politics, society, and economics, culture, science, the arts, and international life means that they should be open to Christ as well as human love and the family. So gospel-inspired lay people need to be engaged in these realities, competent to promote them, and conscious that they exercise to the full their Christian powers, which are repressed and buried, and that they, these gifts will be at the service of the kingdom of God and therefore at the service of salvation in Christ without losing or sacrificing their human content but pointing to a transcendent dimension. That's from his apostolic exhortation to the laity. Again, I think we see it's in Redemptor Hominus that that openness to Christ, that joining of Christ to each man in all their concrete circumstances, that is where the new evangelization takes root. George Weigel, of course, also lists this as an achievement. He said he returned the papacy to the evangelical roots of Peter as pastor and evangelist. Of course, we can't forget Paul VI was his mentor. And Weigel also said the exhortation, Be Not Afraid, which inspired hundreds of millions of lives, especially the young. Well, here I would say Redemptor Hominus begins this process of evangelization because the first thing for evangelization we learn from Pope Paul VI is that the evangelizers must be first evangelized. I see Redemptor Hominus as John Paul II's profound attempt, first really opening or formulation of what must be done, what must be learned by the faithful to be evangelizers. The evangelizers must be first evangelized. So John Paul II, in Redemptor Hominus, I think has given to the church this profound meditation on the Redeemer of man, in which we can learn so much about the message that we are to live and to communicate. And that's been the purpose of these lessons we've made available to form and deepen our awareness of the faith. A third point I would say, John Paul II was a promoter of freedom and freedom of conscience, 
Not only did he bring down the evil empire of the Soviet Union, but promoted true love and service in the face of consumerism and the reductionism in the West. This is the theme of Redemptor Hominus, freedom, that true freedom must be based on truth, that freedom of conscience is the chief mark of a decent regime today. This is what led him to be such a courageous advocate of truth and inspire a revolution of conscience, as Weigel said, that led to European communism's collapse, but also to a deep challenge to liberal societies in the West who have lost their way and have an idea of freedom which has lost a sense of responsibility or purpose. That is the very theme explored in Redemptor Hominus. As a fourth thing I would mention, John Paul II was a great pope of reconciliation and peace. He reached out to many groups. He sought reconciliation across century-old divides and personal animosities. Weigel mentioned he calls it an unprecedented initiative seeking Christian unity, new Catholic Jewish relationships, and dialogue with other world religions, and that he redefined a broader notion of interreligious life by respecting other religions as having truths that are related to one truth, which is God. Again, these themes, I think you'll agree, just spring right out of Redemptor Hominus, especially section 18 on the spirit as an answer to the materialism of our age, that this should appeal to all men and women at the depth of their being. And he constantly spoke about the need in this encyclical for Christians to gather around the mystery of Christ. And it's the truth of God and the dignity of the person that is the basis for dialogue. Then the last thing I would mention in my list of five of the great accomplishments of the pontificate of John Paul II. Again, it's so hard to list them all out, but these would be the five I would start on, and um, I'm sure there are others. But I would mention, because this one might not be as obvious, but in his own way. This is a deeply significant thing that John Paul II's life and writing has led to a renewal of the teaching of St. Thomas and what is called integral humanism. We know that John Paul II studied at the Angelicum, loved the teaching of St. Thomas Aquinas, and again, a little-known fact about his accomplishments was his refounding of the Pontifical Academy of St. Thomas. This was an academy started by Pope Leo XIII at the very beginning of the great tradition of social encyclicals. And it's often forgotten that with all the great social encyclicals of Leo XIII and then many that come after, by the other popes, that the first one that he did to launch the whole effort was called a Terni Patris, and it was on the renewal of Christian philosophy. It was on a renewal of the thought of St. Thomas, which took off and developed in the early 20th century. But by the time of Vatican II, St. Thomas was often pushed out and forgotten. And I think if one reads John Paul II's writings, one discovers how closely he followed the teaching of Thomas. And that's why he sought to renew the charter of the Pontifical Academy of St. Thomas. And he gave to Thomas Aquinas a new title not only the angelic doctor, not only the common doctor of the church,
but he said that Thomas Aquinas is the doctor humanitatis, the doctor of humanity. Now just think of that in light of Redemptor Hominus, where man is the way of the church. Thomas Aquinas, then, is to be an important guidance to us in the church today. John Paul II was a professor and an intellectual along with a pastor, but he was keenly aware of the need for the renewal of philosophy and theology along the lines of personalism and following the thought of John Paul II. This is what he accomplished. His theology of the body also has to do with this integral humanism, and so I would say fides et ratio and veritatis splendor this is part of what comes out of Redemptor Hominus, the integral humanism. Weigel includes in his list that he showed history is driven by culture. Culture includes religion and that democracies must be built upon a vibrant and moral culture. I guess I'm including this under this renewal of Thomism and integral humanism. Because as I explained in one of our earlier lessons, integral humanism means to look at human nature in its full truth, as embodied, as in time, as social and political, but opening up into the pursuit of beauty, truth, and goodness, into philosophy, and ultimately it is fulfilled in our religious quest, and the, redeem the Redeemer of man, by reforging that link of wisdom and love, is the source of the renewal of culture, and therefore the deep source of building an authentic political association and service to mankind. Okay. The second and last part now of my conclusion, I would like to turn to the great line of encyclicals. A total of 14 were written by John Paul II in his time as Pope. I like to use a classification developed by Pope Benedict XVI, which he explains it can be found in his book, My Beloved Predecessor. He explains that these encyclicals should be grouped into four groups. The first group, he says, is a trilogy on God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Obviously, then, it begins with Redemptor Hominus on the Son. This was soon followed by an encyclical entitled Dives in Misericordia, which is on the Father as a merciful Father, and then completed by a very long encyclical on the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life. Pope Benedict explained, I'd just like to read a passage or two here, he says, on God the Father. The theme of the Father appears hidden under the title of Dives and Misericordia. It's a theme by which he was inspired by Sister Saint Faustina Kowalska of Krakow, in whom he learned the message of divine mercy. And at the heart of that encyclical, you'll see his teaching on the cross. Again, you could say the root then of that encyclical is in Redemptor Hominus. If in Redemptor Hominus we look to the Son, we know the Son looks to the Father. He who has seen Jesus has seen the Father. And so he reiterates that in terms of salvation history, the presence of mercy. But again, as Pope Benedict so well explains, he says the focal point of the encyclical is a profound interpretation of the prodigal son 
in which the image of the Father shines forth in all its greatness and beauty. And he ends the encyclical by saying, the church must live the practice of mercy, which again I would hook into Redemptor Hominus this way, if the way of the church is the way of man, solicitude for man, an appreciation of the dignity of man, it's through our practice of mercy that we can live and discover what the redemption is in our own lives and in the lives of others. If we go to the second group of encyclicals, he says they are the social encyclicals. The social encyclicals include the following. an encyclical on work, one on social concerns, and one a reflection on rerum novarum called centesima sanus. These three great social encyclicals apply the Pope's anthropology to the social problems of our day. And you could say those very formulas he outlined in Redemptor Hominus now get explained or used that there should be a priority of ethics over technology, of persons over things, which more specifically will mean the dignity of man over the means of production, to respect labor or work over capital. And that The center of these encyclicals is the dignity of man who's been redeemed by Christ and enveloped by Christ, who should never be a means or fodder for an economic or political system. So in these encyclicals, he clarifies the great questions of contemporary society in contrast to both Marxism and liberalism which John Paul II will say, particularly of communism and why it fell. He said, the error of socialism is primarily an anthropological one. That's why we must look back to Redemptor Hominus to understand the mystery of man in the mystery of Christ. Okay, the third group of encyclicals he calls the ecclesial encyclicals. These include an encyclical on Mary, the mother of the Redeemer, an encyclical Ut Unum Sint on unity between among Christians, mission of the Redeemer on our missionary mandate, on Cyril and Methodius, on evangelization and enculturation, and the fifth one, his last one, and in a way, His most profound is on the Eucharist. Again, it would be too much to get into the details of any of these, but relating them to Redemptor Hominus, I think you can see the Mary, Mary, the mother of God, how he ends the encyclical with that idea of Mary, the mother of the church. He goes on to write the full understanding of how the mother of the Redeemer is the mother of the church. Ut unum sent on Christian unity. We see those appeals he made to gather around the mystery of Christ. Mission of the Redeemer to see that we are sent by Christ with this message of the Redeemer of man. And of course the Eucharist, he devoted a whole section in Redemptor Hominus to the mystery of the Eucharist and its importance to us. And finally, on Cyril and Methodius, one that's not as well known or read, though a very profound one, because not only does it talk about the saint who came to bring Poland to the faith, but it provides him an opportunity to talk about how Catholic culture should take what is good and beautiful 
in any culture and in all human beings' aspiration for the good, and not destroy it, but elevate it, purify it, and offer it up to the Lord. And then the last group, in some ways we could say the most philosophic, the most profound, is exploring the anthropological dimension. These are called by Pope Benedict the anthropological encyclicals. They include Veritatis Splendor, on the splendor of truth, particularly as it pertains to conscience and the reality of conscience and the importance of conscience. There's an encyclical on fides et ratio, on faith and reason, which I would say takes the method of redemptor hominess using faith and reason and taking that quest for God which comes out of the dynamic powers of the soul and expressed through reason and how faith brings that to a completion, that I think we see in Redemptor Hominus. And then um, the third one that he mentions is on the gospel of life. Now in some way I first thought Gospel of life should be placed over with the social encyclicals. But I understand why John Paul, or excuse me, why Pope Benedict would put that in with the anthropological encyclicals, because it has to do with life at its most vulnerable points where we may not see the dignity of life or for various reasons we are blinded to the dignity of life. And in this encyclical, he talks about this need to cultivate a culture of life and to oppose a culture of death. And that the first way to achieve that is through contemplation and a return to appreciating the mystery of God but I would say the tie to redemptor hominess would be most clearly seen in a passage in the Gospel of Life in which he says, it's the blood of Christ that has redeemed us. We have all been purchased at the price of his blood. And that includes all human beings, however small or vulnerable, from conception until natural death, that Christ who has united himself with all human beings is united with each person so that their life is a treasure and a gift from God. And so, my friends, this does end our lessons on Redemptor Hominus. We have done what we could to get into that depth of the mystery that John Paul II lived. We see the various dimensions that he articulated, the human and the divine, the need to see how the threats and opportunities of the modern world should make Christians all the more eager to go forward, to affirm the dignity and work and pray that the life of Christ may be found in each human being. So for this, we are very thankful for the life and work of St. John Paul II. And this encyclical, The Redeemer of Man, should not only be our introduction to his thought in life, but I would say a point to which we return continually as we read other encyclicals or engage in the works of evangelization to gather around that mystery as John Paul II did for us in this encyclical. Thank you.